So uh, Pastor and I, uh, we're going to have a sit-down conversation. It is something that's really common in churches now. Because uh, Christmas season, uh, we were kind of talking about doing something a little more unique and a little more different. And this is pretty common right now in church cultures where one pastor will interview the senior pastor, a staff member will. And I figured we have a pastor that's been in ministry 40-plus years, married. Pat, I'm going to look at you, 53 53 years. Do you not know, Pastor? <laughs> it's close. We'll just round up. 55 years. <laughs> so what a, what a greater opportunity for us than to glean and to learn from uh, our senior pastor. Would you agree? Can you show some love to Pastor Jim? This is brother and sister up here, and here's what brings joy to me, and I've got a bunch of other grandkids, and it's all the same, you know, I feel the same about all of them, but they're here today, and Tammy would feel the same about her kids, everybody would feel the same, but both of these kids, what brings me that deep feeling of joy and satisfaction and glow through the spirit is that both of these kids, they were Lee's second third. Lindsay was born first. Uh, she's a special needs child. You know, she sits in the back. How old is Lindsay? She's 23. Can you believe that? And uh, But special needs. But these two came out different. And because of her, <laughs> maybe, right? In a different way. But because of her, they're different. They, you know, they have a sensitivity that some kids don't have. But both of these are going on a mission trip this year. You're going to Guatemala? All right, same place. <laughs> full of terrorists and stuff. And you're going to Rome? Full of Catholics and terrorists. <laughs> they're both going to different places. <laughs> so they're both doing their thing, you know. So, And he's going to be working the fields and the coffee plantations and, you know, sharing the witness. Uh, he started off at Cornerstone playing baseball after all he was there. Threw out his arm. So he went to Grand Valley Community, but he was excited, you know, and visiting and all kinds of other stuff. And he joined a Christian group on campus. How many know you can stay saved on campus? <laughs> Even if it's a secular thing. And he's doing well, and he's going on a mission trip with that Christian, Christian group. Lexi, of course, she's singing that heart song, which is uh, there's a traveling worship team and evangelist that kind of just spreads the joy from things from that novel film to youth rallies, all that kind of stuff. And uh, and he also is our first a cappella group volunteer. Our two boys are doing a cappella work. So we've got people in our church that are excelling academically, excelling, you know, in gymnastics, in baseball, in singing. How many know God's gifted this church? And I can just say this, for all your kids that I don't know what they do, but you're proud of them just because they're serving the Lord. It brings us great joy from the inside, and it bubbles up. How many remember that Sunday school song? It's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. Nobody. <laughs> well, thank God I won't sing it for you then. But you guys are dismissed, but I want you to know they bring me joy. Amen. Amen. But it's a combination pain in the neck, too, so it's both at one time. All right. Go ahead. All right. All right. We're traveling into unfamiliar waters, uncharted territory with All Pastor right. Turner. Let's start with the hard-hitting, uh, most theological question that I think everybody, young and old in here, want to know. What is Pastor Turner's favorite Christmas movie and song? Wow. Ernest Saves Christmas. No, I don't yeah, know if you remember that one. <laughs> you know what? I don't know because I like a lot of them, but I, I would have to say my favorite one is a Walton's one called The Homecoming. I don't know why I like it. It's a created problem that they solve, et cetera, et cetera. But I, 
I look forward to watching that. I've never heard of the Waltons. Can you explain for us that are 43 and younger who this band of mischievous vandals are? Well, it's, I don't know. Okay. I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain them. <laughs> All right. So uh, just kind of getting an icebreaker out of the way. So uh, the biggest gift um, received this time of year is obviously the gift of Jesus. So we want to try to focus on staying with that message as we're talking to Pastor Turner today. And in Acts 20, 35, um, there's a quote of Jesus. It says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. That is the essence of Christmas, giving and receiving. So, Pastor, we feel the blessing when we get a good gift. What do you think the Lord is communicating to us in this statement that it is more blessed to give than to receive? Boy, that's a good question. Uh, there's something about giving that unless you've ever done that, if, you know, if you're a young person, a lot of times you've been on the receiving end. As you get older, you learn to give. And um, it's just extraordinary. It brings that joy out to give and to watch somebody else that you're able to help by the gift that you give, whether it's big or small, whether it's the gift of helping them, whether it's the gift of just of finances or, or money or any other time of the year. But it is more blessed. There's a, there's a benefit to giving that you only get by experiencing it. You know, you can talk about it till you're blue in the face, but when you give something that's very important to you, yeah. to somebody else, to see that they get blessed, it's an awesome thing. Now, the best gift that I ever received in my whole life. Now, I can't remember much when I was a kid. That's a long time ago. I can't, you know, really I can't. But I remember, and I've shared this here before, as I was a pastor up in Clare, Michigan, and we went up there the first couple of years, we lived way out in the country. And we had given up everything to go. So to me, I, it was a great sacrifice to give up a great job with all the benefits and to go to a place where there was nothing promised you and then Christmas was, a, from my mother's side of the family, it was a big deal. My dad's side, my grandmother, she lived in New Orleans. We hardly ever saw her. But from my father's, or my mother's side was the Polish side, and they liked to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And my grandpa was the first one that introduced Santa Claus. You talk about a scraggly suit <laughs> with a scraggly beard bought from Sears Roebuck. But mm -hmm. they taught us just that excitement. And so Christmas was big big time for our family all the way through the years. We got up north, and we had the three kids. Jeff was a baby, and the other two kids were, I don't know how old they were, but uh, I think Jim's six years older than Jeff. Sherry's two years older than him. But it didn't have anything. And so uh, a guy in the church gave us a check for $1,000. That, that was a lot of money back then. Mm -hmm. And I received that gift with great joy. How many can Because it came out of nowhere. Yeah. But then I was able to take that gift and give gifts with that gift. And then, it, to me, it felt better to give that than when I received it. Yeah. You know? So I don't, I'm not a guy that sits around the mailbox waiting for a gift to come in. I don't. I just let the gifts flow as they might. But I enjoy giving to people. I think one of the hardest things for us to um, be available for is when – in this season of giving, it, it just saps us, like, emotionally, financially. Um, and so there's so many different ways that I think we put a high emphasis on uh, the type of gift that we give and, like, the dollar amount. So what would you say is something that you notice that prevents us from honoring the words of Jesus, that it's more blessed to give than to receive? Fear. Yeah. No, we're afraid if we give it, we're going to lose it and we... You know, we're going to be poor the rest of our lives, you know. But I've learned, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Amen. But when you give at first, there's that fear that, well, if I give that away, I won't have anything for myself. Or I won't have anything for my family. But if God leaves you to give, like I can say no to gifts. You go shopping. You want to round this up? I have no problem saying, no, I hit that box, no. You know, and I'm not going to give every Salvation Army that I cross yeah. some money. I'll give it where I want to give it. If someone's jing jingling that bell, <laughs> like we used to live up north, go to Saginaw to the mall, 
And there would be this one old guy out there. He would sing Rudolph. I couldn't help but give him money because, <laughs> man, he was just there doing it. But, you know, it's one of those things you don't have to give to everybody, but you choose where that gift goes, and it's awesome. Like last year, my sister called me. She lives up north by herself. She moved up there because we lived up there, and her husband died Christmas Eve, you know, uh, many years ago. And my dad and I rushed up there, and uh, but she stayed there, and she says, Jim, and I've never given her nothing because her and I kind of <laughs> – most of our uh, <laughs> life growing up together anyway. But she had, uh, she said, I don't know how I'm going to get my heating oil. So I just decided to send her money. I didn't answer the phone so she could thank me for it. I just wanted to bless her that she could have, wouldn't have to worry about that, and she could take care of whatever else she has to do. And I felt blessed to give. What would have stopped me? Hatred and, hey, why should I give her nothing? She never gave me nothing. And attitudes like that. How many know what I'm talking about? But that's my sister. She needs my help, and I'm glad to help her. Amen? All right, Susie, I know you're listening. I love you. Send that love gift in. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, one of the most, probably the most uh, infamous, like, well-known scriptures would be John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And when we read that scripture, it really puts the essence of the Father and should be the essence of the church. Uh, draw it to mind like this. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, what do you believe the gift says about the giver? That he must love the recipient of that gift. Oh, amen. That he would give the very best that he would have. And I don't even think we understand that. You know, because we've heard it all our life, it's kind of trite in our minds. But when you meditate on how much God loves us to the fact that he would, I don't even understand the Trinity. Pastor, you've been doing this for 40 plus years. I don't understand it. I just believe that it is. I know God's the Father, he's the Son, and he's the Holy Spirit. I believe all that. But I don't get how you can do that. You know, from a human perspective, we can't give our sons up. Actually, it would be sin to sacrifice, to kill our sons and, you know, give it to Ben. Heck, the poor kid would never have a sugar cookie if he lived with you. I don't want that, man. It's the way to live. That's it, man. When I pass out that candy next week, stay away, my friend. I'll take the orange. You got the orange. It's going to be a sour one, too, with a little black spot on it. Now, that's a gift that really brings me pleasure to give. Now, so what were we talking about? I know it. But God loves us that much, and it's hard. Hard to realize that. And I don't think children realize how much their parents love them. Amen. Because they bug you all the time. They nag you all the time. But they don't realize the love that you have for each individual. They'll never know until they're a parent themselves. And then we get older, so they just shove us to the side. Do you hear that, all my kids over there? <laughs> and, uh, but, I mean, it's just we don't realize it. And God, to love the world so much, as perverse and evil as it can be, is a, is a miracle. That says a lot about the giver, that he's willing to do everything he can for everyone on this planet. So what do you think God's message is to humanity by giving his only son to us? What do you think his message is? It says, I love you, and I want you to be with me, and the only way you can be with me is through my son, because you can't live up to the standards that are set Amen. because of your human nature. Amen. Can I just make a note? If you're not taking notes, I really encourage this. Pastor's really feeding the flock right now with some good wisdom. So I'm, I'm hearing some belching out there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is probably, this is only about um, midway through um, our discussion, but it's probably the most important question that we're going to ask today. How can people receive that gift of Jesus? You know, because we've all heard the invitation, and we all think we, we have done that. But it's as simple as realizing that, you're not all that you think you are, that you, you know, you're not as good as you think you are, that as good as you are, you fall short of the standard that God set, has set for us. But he's made a, he's made a provision for us that, that he, he was the perfect sacrifice. He was born of a virgin. I mean, there's a whole another story line here, but he was born in a supernatural way that no one has ever been born that way. No one ever will again. But it was God 
being the father, overshadowing Mary, he became that perfect son, lived a perfect life, offered it willingly as a sacrifice. And as we look ahead, he died for us. And if we can just receive that, just receive it, take it by faith and believe that God is in our hearts as we accept him, as we receive him, as we surrender to him and allow him to come into our hearts and we surrender to his word and the promptings of the spirit. We all got our ideas, but most of them are wrong. Get them out of the book. Amen. And when you get them out of the book, you realize these are God's thoughts, and I want to line mine up with his. And he says that whosoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life yes. for as many as received him. Amen. So I just, I beg you almost to receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. Otherwise, Christmas is nothing but a secular, beautiful holiday that we eat, drink, and be merry. You know, it's okay to applaud when pastor says something that's no, like don't. absolute. You know, that was good. That was good. Let's, yeah, that's true. That's absolute truth. Um, I'm going to throw a question out um, that wasn't on the sheet. Uh, and it just has to do with, I remember uh, the summer prior to my salvation, uh, my brother was getting baptized. And he had asked me to go see him. And, you know, I was a heathen. Uh, I was not in a good way at all. And I remember standing in the back of the Peer Assembly of God and the Holy Spirit um, speaking to my heart, I want you, I want you, I want you, and I rejected that gift. So um, the question, Pastor, that I would have for you is, why do you believe people when they feel, when they feel the conviction of the Spirit? Why do we resist Him? Same thing, fear. I'm not walking up there. Who does he think he is? I'm an old bald-headed man with a lot of spunk. That's who I am. But there's that fear of walking up and exposing yourself to people that I need a Savior, and it's hard. Same thing for me. I remember the first time I walked forward, I was already saved, but I went to a Baptist church up in Pontiac, and I just got off of work, went to Revival, a red-headed evangelist. Oh, was he fiery, man, that guy. And uh, it was just hard to get up and walk in, up in front of people. Yeah. It's kind of embarrassing. But you know what? When I did, man, the Holy Spirit just witnessed to my spirit. And I just felt, wow. So it's the same thing that keeps us from the blessings of God. It's that four-letter word, fear. And what does the Christmas story say? Fear not. That's what I think. Hey, Amen. I've been wrong before. Amen. So, <laughs> so we're going to shift gears into some Christmas questions. And uh, before we get in there, just a candid question for you, Pastor. Is there any particular memory at Christmas time that sticks out with you, whether growing up or currently? Again, my childhood's. Way back there, so I don't remember. Okay. I do remember, again, back up in Clare, you know, we always had white Christmases up there. It seemed like it. And this one year, uh, and I've said this story in church too, but we kept, hey, when we built onto our church up there when we had that building, they put a bathroom in my office. Hallelujah. Oh, man, that was awesome. And that was a fist fight to get that, man. I'm not kidding. But that's the one I won. I won that fight. But I hid all our Christmas gifts in there. And on Sunday night coming home from church, uh, I couldn't make it up the hill because there was freezing rain and it turned to snow. And I had an old Impala. Not that there's anything wrong with Impalas, but the old ones, it was rear-wheel drive. I just couldn't get up the hill, halfway up and slide down. So the car was packed with presents with care. And uh, so I said, we lived, you know, behind us was, there was 5,000 acres in front of us, a whole lot of land behind us, but there was a flat spot where I could cut through the woods with my car. I didn't make it. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then the next morning, that rain turned to snow. It was like a blizzard. So I called uh, one of the guys from the church. Eventually, we got out, but I had to get on my snowmobile. This was a fun time. And I took garbage bags and put all the presents in there. And I got all those presents home. That was the best time I've ever had in my life. Man. <laughs> and it started with a problem. I mean, all problems get solved. And, you know, if you're watching any TV, it's a problem, and then they solve it. So that was a problem that God solved. I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> got that snowmobile going. And, uh, oh, St. Nick, man, it was, oh, that's who I was that year. One of my personal favorite stories of yours about Christmas time is when your grandson Sam was afraid of the beheaded Santa in your basement and he wouldn't go downstairs. 
I was hoping you would tell that, but hey, I was trying to keep that secret. <laughs> All right. How many remember Roger Miller? Well, yeah. him and I, he was a firm believer in St. Nick, you know, now just uh, the statue kind. So we went to Bronner's, and we both bought these, yeah, about a four-foot Santa Claus. You press them down, and they go into a box. And they hooked to a microphone so you could stand behind somewhere and just talk, and his lips would move. And uh, I still got mine to this day. But my grandkids were afraid, and his head came off. <laughs> How'd you like to open that box? <laughs> but I, I knew he was afraid, so I put him on the porch, and it's motion activated. So he would start dancing, and he wouldn't come in the house. So. <laughs> and he's never been the same since. Um, <laughs> Taking notes, man. I have fun. Of life. <laughs> well, Luke 2, verses 10 to 11 says, But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, kind of like what you're saying. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. Since you've been in ministry, we were trying to figure it out 40 plus years. What has been the, some of the biggest cultural shifts that you've noticed that has caused people to lose sight of Jesus during Christmas time? Well, that's a good, there's more than one, but uh, when we were growing up, and as we were bringing up our kids, we decided when those kids come home from school, I want mom home. Because they get into a lot of trouble when there's no one there. Well, of course, your kids don't, but most kids do. And so we decided that's the way we do it. But the cultural shift is that both parents are working, almost got to work to afford the homes that they're in. And in our culture today is kids won't come to church. Parents give them the right to choose not to come. I'm not forcing them to go. I think that's a bad mistake. And I, I really do think it's a bad mistake. And young people don't even want to get married anymore. So they don't, they don't want to get married. They don't want to have children. And so the cultural shift is us dinosaurs are dying out. You know, we're hoping for rapture, but we're getting older. And there's no one to replace us. And the young people, if they don't go to church, they're not going to, they're not going to celebrate Christ at Christmas. They're going to celebrate the gifts, the food, and all that that goes around with it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love all that stuff. So can you, uh, with the younger generation in here, the youth, the kids that are in here right now, can you just speak to them uh, off of that? Well, they're here. So, I mean, I'm not really speaking to them. But I'll just say that if you're not exposed to the gospel and if you're not tenderized to what the Christmas story is, it's about being born of a virgin, of God being the father. I mean, you think about that, it's an impossible thing, and it sounds like a fairy tale unless you've been brought up with that. And um, I never doubted it. You know, we were raised Catholic. I never doubted that, and I looked forward to it. I believed it, and, you know, God's been good to us. So I would tell the kids, get into the Bible. Prove it's real for yourself. I, you know, I did something intentional with my granddaughter, Lexi. You know, all the boys, nah, they didn't want to go to, you know, where I wanted them to go to college. But Lexi had a little bit of talent. Oh, wait a minute. She had a lot of talent. So, you know, I wanted to expose her. So I took her several years ago to a council where she competed, you know, for um, in music. But exposed her to that university because I want her to be a Christian young lady. I want her to have the values that we pass down and the values of, of love in, in Christ and Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no Christmas. Right. And I would, I would say to everyone that's here that, you know, we know he's the reason for the season. We have a lot of fun with the other stuff. But I tell you what, there's something about Jesus Christ. And it's something about when my kids, grandkids and my kids, choose him over everything else that brings me a great joy right. and peace. And that no matter what they do, if they stay in God's will. So you could go to Michigan State or the University of Michigan. You could go to any school. If you decide, you can be a good Christian doing missionary work on the side trying to lead people to Christ or just trying to be an example. You can go anywhere. But, man, if I can get my kids in a Christian place, I mean, that's just you're brought up with those values. Dr. Michelle Bankston, you ever heard of her? Michelle? Michelle, yeah. Never heard of her. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
We'll call her Shell Bell. She writes, uh, Romans 15, 13 conveys that joy is a gift. The scripture is, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Ebenezer Bible Fellowship of Bethlehem writes, Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to the one who is born again. And those gifts are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's Galatians 5.22. So taking these two statements, if someone has the ability to impart or give something, then they would be the gifter and we would be the gifted. Would you agree that joy is a gift that God gives to his people? Oh, absolutely. It's like a fruit. It just grows. If you stay plugged into Christ, you're going to be a joyful person. And, uh, I mean, that doesn't mean you're happy all the time. Because if the lions lose, what's going to happen? <laughs> I mean, they brought great joy to, to Michigan. Yeah. They lift our spirits. But if they lose, <laughs> but joy comes from the, the Holy Spirit. Well, John 10.10 10 reminds us that there is a thief whose purpose is to steal and kill and destroy Knowing that the good news will cause great joy, how does the thief steal that great joy of the good news? You forgot one part of that scripture, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. So I'm going to stop there. No, if the thief comes, as soon as someone receives the gospel, bang, he throws a doubt in your way. Yep. You go home, you know, if, if, if you're saved, your wife or husband isn't or your kid isn't, you go home and they'll give you a, an irritating word and boom, try to steal that joy. Or someone, when I first accepted Christ, I was a truck driver. I drove semi-trucks. And the guys I worked with did everything in their power to bring me down. I mean, they, they would call me Rev. They would tackle me. They would make fun of me. They would do everything they, they could. That, that's the devil working. Just coming in and trying to pluck that seed. Yep. Trying to get you to go to a bar and get drunk. Trying to get you to do this. Trying to get you to do that. So the enemy comes to steal whatever it is that you have. I would think most people in this congregation want to have a family, want to have a loving family that they feel like they belong to, I mean, personally and then as a group. And if the enemy will come to do everything he can to break up a family, that's why I'm saying, if you listen to me, that the enemy has done everything in his power to break up the American family. If you can break the family up, you've won the battle. You know, you watch what most issues are, and you'll find it's from the breaking up of the family. So the enemy, so you got something the enemy wants? It's your family. Protect it with all that you have. I tell you what. But Jesus said he's come that we might have life to the full. And that's where I'm going. I want a full life. I want to experience everything he has for me. Amen? Amen. Man, I want to drink Verner's. I want to live long enough to drink a can of Verner's all the way through without stopping. I can tell you I never thought of that. <laughs> thought of it, but never made it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Remember, this was your idea. I've got to compose myself. I didn't know anybody loved Werner so much. Man, I tasted that stuff. It was bad. It's like acid reflux. <laughs> he don't like White Castle. Either. There's something wrong with this guy, man. Okay, we, we usually sandwich the joy of Christmas to the day after Thanksgiving to when the presents have been opened and then the trash cans come out and we throw everything away. But I've noticed uh, throughout the year just knowing you and Pat that you are givers. You two are givers year-round. Is there any advice on how we can maintain the joy throughout the year so it's not just seasonal? Well, Steve used to call me a giver all the time, so I guess you're <laughs> right, man. I mean, it, just live the Christian life, you Amen. know. I mean, yeah. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Just yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, and he'll give you opportunities to give an encouraging word, to, to give you know, a compliment when it's, when it's necessary, just to be kind to people. That's giving. And, you know, if, if you've got a lot of money, he'll lead you to get rid of that. You know, last week I said, uh, you know, Evangel University is an Assembly of God university. Mm -hmm. And as of this year, you know, Hobby Lobby, they've given $30 million, and there's more coming. That's insane. Awesome. You know, so that's giving. Yeah. From a, you just think about that. And there's corporations now are looking for colleges, universities that have that message where it's not just secular. It's not all this stuff they're teaching today, but it's, it's that worldview. They're looking 
to pump money into those places yeah. and pulling it away from some of the bigger universities. So I say, you want to be a blessing? Shop at Hobby Lobby. Buy a chicken sandwich from where? Chick-fil-A. Yeah, no. I would if they were around. <laughs> so how can we prevent the enemy from having access to our joy? Knowing he, what his motives are, the word is clear. How can we prevent him? What safeguards can we put up? Well, joy disappears when we disobey God. Joy disappears. If you're a troublemaker, you will not have joy. If you're a pot stirrer, what's that? A pot stirrer stirs up trouble wherever they go. They bring up stuff like family times. I love my family. And when my brother and I get together, I love to make fun of them. I love to poke at them. And he loves to do it back. So we, to, that's Christmas for me. And uh, so it's all good. But sometimes when there's serious issues in a family, let it go. I mean, don't bring up Trump this Christmas. And don't give a Democrat a bobblehead of Trump. And don't give me one of the other guy either. I don't want Sleepy Joe on my uh, thing. So, I mean, we can stir up trouble that way if we want to. If you want to stir up trouble, you can't avoid it. Say something good about them. I've learned from my family I can't brag about Lexi. I can't brag about uh, Jacob throwing 94.5 miles an hour. I can't brag about any of them amongst the other families because everybody gets, oh, well, forget it. That's our family thing. So Pat says, keep your mouth shut. And that's what I do. Amen. <laughs> I don't know if I answered so, your no, question. No, you're good. Tonight. Keep our mouths shut. That's keep what we're going to do. Yep. <laughs> don't be jealous. You know, you don't go. have Amen. bitterness inside of you. Amen. Absolutely. When you see that new Cadillac in my driveway, let it go. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, Matthew 1. Uh, this is the hard-hitting questions. Are you ready? We're going to start wrapping it up pretty soon. Praise um, God. Matthew 1 gives us the account of Joseph accepting God's will and becoming Jesus' earthly father. Mary was pledged to be married. Before Joseph and Mary came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19 says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quality. Quality, quietly, there we go. He had in mind to divor divorce her quietly. What does this small portion of scripture reveal to us about Joseph's character? Well, he was a, he was a tender man, compassionate man. But like any man, if you're dating a girl and you haven't had relationships with her, which you shouldn't until after you get married. Boy, that wasn't very good, was it? But that's what I think. And uh, it would be tough decision. But for him, he could have exposed her. He could have got her probably stoned if he wanted to. Just to have that compassion to do it quietly, to do it privately, uh, speaks volumes of him. So in today's culture, Mary could have been tempted by abortion. Social media could have humiliated her. But God sends a messenger to Joseph on her behalf. And that was enough to convince him. But as a man, could you empathize with Joseph's hesitation on believing Mary? And why and why not? Do you have to bring this up? Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I wouldn't have married her. Hey, no. I mean, if that's someone else's baby, let him pay for it. I'm not going to do it. That's how I would feel right now. And uh, so I think he felt the same way, but he wasn't as blunt as I'm being. And so he was going to divorce her. But then an angel came to him, and that's what it would take for me. It would take an angel to come to me and say, Jim, that baby that Pat has is of the Holy Ghost. And I would think, because you know what? We hear the story, and it's old for us, but it never happened before then. But it must have been so convincing and that it's so real that he, he did exactly what the angel told him to do. He chose to make that choice. So, yeah. Amen. Amen. So, our final question. Is in there a prize after it? For you? Absolutely. Yeah, I got, yeah. <laughs> in verses 22 to 23, we read, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will, will be with child and conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
How is the name Emmanuel significant to us today? Well, that we can know no matter what ever happens in your life, because circumstances for all of us change. It's good, it's bad. It's good, you know, you trip up. But we can always know if we keep it in our heart that God is with us no matter where we go, no matter what happens to us, no matter what situation we're in. I remember we went to Cosmel, Mexico, Pat and I. It was kind of like a pre-mission trip. No, we took the family that year. So all, our whole family went. No, we were by ourselves. <laughs> but Pat always had problems with pregnancies and bleeding. She almost bled to death in that hotel room. And we had to get home. We're in Mexico. How many know Mexico? No offense to Rudy, but how many know Mexico? Man, you don't want to get treated there if you, you don't have to. But a doctor came to our room. I mean, don't want to be gross, but the, there was blood everywhere. And gave her an old-fashioned drug that stopped it and got us home. So things happen in our lives, but God was with us. He was with that Mexican doctor. He was with us to get us on the plane and make it home. He's always been with us. Amen. And that's the essence of John. That's the, you know, God is with us. Amen. And then in closing, can I just say this? I'm not going to preach to you, but can I say we all have a choice. We all have a decision to make about our futures. You know, Mary chose to listen to the angel. She made a decision to be God's handmaid. She chose to do it. She didn't have to. She chose to do it. Joseph chose to make a decision to say yes to God and to be that father. You know, the shepherds chose to listen to the everything. Every person, the magi, chose to follow that star and give gifts. But Herod chose something different. He chose to be mean, to be murderous, to be angry. And can I tell you, this Christmas season, to me it's always a happy season. Always. I'm going to have fun no matter what. But can I say I chose not to eat one sugar cookie so far this year. It's not about weight. It's about blood sugar stuff. So, But I chose to do that so far so good. But if I see a no-bake cookie back there, I might choose to eat one. We'll see what happens. But I want to tell you something. We choose you want to have a joyous Christmas, choose to do so. Choose to do it. Whatever you get under that tree, I usually get a visa bill. <laughs> you choose to do whatever you want. I mean, choose to be joyous. Choose to be happy with your family. If you've got little kids running around driving you nuts, let them mess the living room up. Choose to do that. But make a choice to put Christ first this Christmas season. Come and get your picture taken through the tree. They were going to put the trees up here this year. And I said, how are people going to get their pictures taken? The fights, everybody, the randos, how are they going to get their pictures taken? They like taking pictures next to those dumb old trees, you know. But we'd love to have you here. But we're going to put Christ first. We're going to sing about it. Christmas Eve evening, there will be candles like you've never, never seen. There will be singing. We're singing the old carols the way they were meant to be sung. And Brian's happy about it. So he's happy about it. Sarah's happy about it. But we're going to sing those songs just like Ebenezer Scrooge was in the house, you know. So we're going to sing it like that. We're going to put Jesus first. We're going to celebrate his birthday. So I might even bring the kids in in the morning. Let's have a big old cake. Terry, will you eat some if I bring it? Oh, forget it. I forgot. Yeah, he won't. But we love you. So I want to ask you, you've got a decision to make. If you've never received Christ, make that decision because there's no better life. And the enemy will do everything he can to stop you. We had a young guy uh, voted on the board about, I don't know, five years ago. And I, I warned him. I said, the enemy's going to come after you. I want you to be prepared. It wasn't three weeks their life disintegrated that fast. The enemy came in. So I, can I tell you, have, put on that full armor of God. Decide that you're going to do it God's way no matter what. If you want to live a good Christian life, here's a choice you make. It's kind of like the lions. 
I like that coach of theirs. He's like a big-time wrestler. He's like Hulk Hogan almost, you know. And, uh, and he talks like him too. And he said, what are you doing different to win this game? He said this, we were all doing the right things and we got away from it. Be consistent. Just keep doing the same things over and over again. You read the Bible. You pray. When you come to church, sing with all you've got. Worship the Lord. Be a giving person. And I guarantee you, you'll have joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you live in a bigger house than me, good for you. God bless you. I don't care. If you got a boat that I don't have, I've had a rowboat, sold it to him. That thing's been dry docked for two years, man. I want it back, man. I gave my pontoon away, all those kind of things. I've had those things. It brought happiness, but it didn't bring joy. Jesus brings joy. Being with God's people brings joy. Amen. So let's all stand.